All right, welcome everybody um, to the Ethnic Studies uh, Spring Colloquium. Very excited to have you guys all here. Um, we have two very special uh, guests today uh, who will be speaking about some of their uh, ongoing research. And uh, before we get started, I just want to say a few things um, about, uh, just, I just want to introduce our two speakers for today, but I also want to say a few things um, about our supporters. So I just wanted to thank the Center for Pacific Island Studies, uh, JAPSM uh, Women's Studies, and the Department of Anthropology for all their generous support um, with our spring colloquium. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to say a few things about the two speakers today. And first we have uh, Nicole Grove, who is a PhD candidate in uh, international relations at John Hopkins University. Her work engages um, with the mutations of gender, faith, and politics in the emerging digital worlds of the Arab Gulf and North Africa. And Grove's research focuses on the interface as a site of subject making and techno-political negotiation. And her dissertation is titled Gamers, Hunters, Provocateurs, Digital Mediations of Violence, Gender, and Faith in the Arab World. So, and then next we have uh, Ibrahim Aude. Uh, he's a professor of ethnic studies um, here at UH. And he publishes in two research areas. The first is Hawaii's political economy and Middle East politics. Uh, he's the, also the editor of Arab Studies Quarterly, which is an international journal about Arab affairs. And he teaches courses on Middle East politics, ethnic identity, social movements, and the political economy of Hawaii and the Pacific. So um, join me in welcoming our two speakers for today. Um, so I guess to start us off, uh, we'll have Nicole Grove, who will be introducing some of her research um, and current work. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, also, thank you to the Department of Ethnic Studies for hosting this event, and for Brian, to Brian, and also uh, for Brahim for asking me to participate. Um, <clears throat> uh, despite our different reasons for being here today, I think perhaps uh, we might all share a similar experience of disorientation. Uh, when trying to ascribe coherence uh, to this event that uh, now is referred to as the so-called Arab Spring or the Arab Uprisings. Uh, this feeling or experience of disorientation has a panoply of confounding forces, a few of which I'll discuss today. Uh, however, I want to emphasize that it is amplified by the problem of mediation. Uh, Marshall McLuhan famously said that the medium is the message. Uh, I want to suggest that the mediation is also the message when attempting to speak about recent events in the Arab world. By mediation, I mean the technical, political, and aesthetic tug of war at the heart of knowledge production. Let me try to paint a picture of this tug of war for you, uh, given the topic. Uh, let me ask you a series of questions. What could or should we talk about? Uh, should we discuss how Washington's foreign policy has shifted toward the Middle East in relation to the uprisings or, redrawing, or the redrawing of the geopolitical map according to this or that political axis? What should we make of President Obama's so-called apathy toward the Middle East, a claim that makes sense or limited sense in the case of intervention in Syria, but no sense in the context of Operation Unified Protector? Should we speculate about the possible outcomes of the Egyptian revolution? about the battles for political memory over the revolution between online dissidents, nonprofit media collectives, religious organizations, academics, artists, and the SCAF? What about the plight of rights activists in Saudi Arabia? What new challenges do Palestinian refugees face in Lebanon as a result of the spillover effects of the civil war ensuing next door? Should we discuss the history of the brutality of the Syrian regime as a way of placing blame on Assad for whatever state of affairs defines Syria's political climate? What does this mean for the armed groups that have now perfected the sustained brutality of the regime itself? What about Tunisian President Marzouki lifting the country's state of emergency ban, according to last Thursday's Facebook announcement? Or Tunisia's vote on a new constitution as giving the so-called Arab Spring, according to Larbi Siddiqui's opinion piece on Al Jazeera, English, its badly needed booster shot. I myself just recently returned from a conference in Beirut in January. I could describe my on-the-ground experience to you, but what insights could I possibly convey about real life in Lebanon? I can talk about receiving an email from the State Department every other day for two weeks leading up to my trip, instructing Americans not to travel to Lebanon, and if they did, not to stay in hotels or eat at restaurants where Western patrons frequented. I did both. 
I can tell you about being in the green zones of the Riviera Hotel, the AUB campus, and occasionally Hummer Street for three days where I was afforded safeties as a foreigner that the local population was not. I can speak about the palpable feeling of anxiety, how the people I knew who lived in Beirut spoke in short sentences and low voices about the inevitability of another car bombing in a public place when the conversation came up, and then how they quickly changed the subject. I can talk about being picked up by the cab company hired by the conference organizers. <clears throat> it was 4.30 in the morning and we drove off. When we drove off, the cab driver told me that he needed to go a back way because the section of the highway was closed. We swirled around unfamiliar and empty streets for about 15 minutes, streets that were completely dark except for one or two storefronts where groups of men were talking around folding chairs and folding tables. I made small talk with the driver and felt guilty for worrying that we might not actually be going to the airport. Is it even possible to speak about the human tragedy in Syria? At a UN General Assembly briefing on the humanitarian situation in the country given by US Permanent Representative Samantha Powers last month, she discussed the electrocution of children and how religious leaders gave the residents of Ghouta dispensation to eat cats and dogs. Because regime forces were encircling neighborhoods to starve out anti-government fighters. I'd also recently read an interview with French journalist Sophia Amar, who traveled undercover for 11 days in the areas of Homs, Damascus, and al Rastan to make a documentary about the lives of Syrian resistors. She relayed what one man, who had recently escaped torture by government forces, told her about the expectation of his imminent death. We now dream to die in a civilized way with a beautiful bullet that would end our lives quickly, a bullet made for humans, not for birds, like the ones they fire at us that we would die in a way our families would be able to recognize our corpses. I'll stop here to say that given the disorienting mixture of gravity, hope, helplessness, curiosity, complexity, guilt, fascination, outrage, creativity, and catastrophe that this picture I've tried to create should inspire or I would like it to inspire, I'd like to emphasize the importance of having a panel like this where different people can come together an attempt to think about the multiple myriad life worlds that fall within the parameters of what we are calling the Arab uprisings. I'd also like to emphasize how mediation, meaning how information about these events is collected, relayed, and reproduced in the United States in particular, is a way of naming the swampland of Orientalist histories of unruly Arabs, the frontier wars waged by information technology, and 24-hour news corporations in the pursuit of market expansion and market share. So this disorientation is real, that is, the material conditions are complex. And to make matters worse, mediation also entails the interests of capital and empire that thrive off misrepresentation. In part, I think this feeling is driven by the impulse that we should be able to know, that we should be able to explain, to summarize Arab politics on the ground that are changing profoundly and without pause. It's also driven by the proliferation of new communications technologies and networks and how the speed and scale with which flows of information, people, capital, ideas, and ideas travel uh, are intensifying the compression of the global and the local. In this moment, what we are calling the Arab uprisings, said to have begun in December 2010 with the self-immolation of a man named Muhammad Bouazizi in Tunisia continues into 2014. Today, we lack the benefit of hindsight, of distance and time to confidently assess them, to chart them in their complex global relationality. Even the most thoughtful, sympathetic, and nuanced analyses seem inadequate, or at the very least, tell only a fraction of a fraction of a story. Another related factor has to do with the challenges present in the use of social media for news and instant real-time information. There has been an overall overwhelming enthusiasm for social media platforms as I'm sorry, to act as a kind of virtual public sphere. Uh, a place for organizing and mobilizing political action, particularly in what are termed autocratic societies. It becomes more difficult to do, on, and as it becomes more difficult to do on the ground surveys for academics, journalists, and others as a result of increasing violence in different areas of the Middle East, the academy and the inter international media have increasingly begun to rely on these proprietary platforms for information. The ability to confirm or give support to statements made online about facts on the ground is one issue, but perhaps even more problematic is that this form of mediation encourages us to look at reality in snapshots, flashes of info, and sound bites, 
A Twitter post can only be 150 characters. A Facebook post is usually not much more. This soundbiting of human experience is reinforced in a perfectly packaged post about what is supposed to be the essence of a particular event, person, or group. The nuances of human experience, dignity, confusion, and fear become obscured or contorted in the overcrowding of content and media systems that are continually repurposing the same stories over and over in different forms. So what does this look like? How is it happening? Well, first, unfiltered accounts, stories, Twitter feeds, quotations, in order to create a kind of milieu or a generalized sentiment about the politics of the Arab world, is almost always filtered through a media apparatus in the US that presents this information as a series of binaries. Adele Eskandar has written about this tendency towards binarism when speaking about the Arab world in several frames. Who is the, who is the protagonist and who is the antagonist? In other words, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy? Who should we be rooting for? Let me give you an example. One of the more recent stories gathering attention right now on CNN, Al Jazeera, and other venues like Foreign Policy and the Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment is that the Al-Qaeda central leadership in Syria recently disavowed the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, the ISIL. Al-Sham responded by assassinating Al-Qaeda's representative in the country, Abu Khalid al-Suri. Most of the articles that I've read about this event are either explicitly or implicitly celebratory as it is supposedly further proof of the polarization of Takfiri groups, proof that the Salafi alliance is crumbling, and that this is giving the Free Syrian Army an opening in terms of once again becoming the strongest anti-Assad force on the ground. The good guy, bad guy binarism is translated here into Al-Qaeda bad, ISIL bad, anyone fighting them is good. Everything else about the militias on the ground is relegated to the background. So what gets relegated to the background? Well, the narrative about the beautiful bullet, for one, which I think is, a much closer, is much closer to telling the human cost of war than a story that reads more like speculating over a chess game. Another aspect that gets left out is the shifting position of the Obama administration on Syria and the U.S.-Russia compromise as a result of the June 2012 Geneva Convention, which states that the creation of a transitional government body should be established by both the Assad regime and the opposition, where each would have veto power over the other's proposal to form a new government. There is no discussion of whether or not that amalgam of elements that make up the quote-unquote opposition find this a desirable or even a viable proposal. These disparate but no less relevant aspects of the story are subsumed in the retelling of a much simpler story of jihad is bad and everyone else is good. The other, there are other binarisms as well. Are they friendly or adversarial? In other words, are they interested in perpetuating U.S. interest in the region, or are they anti-Islamist? Are they pro-women's rights? Do they agree with us? Are they protesters or terrorists? Are they peaceful protests or violent protests? This second question, I think, in many instances makes no sense. There is quite a bit of critical analysis of protests in different areas at different times that show some instances where protests were described as peaceful when they were not or when violence was attributed solely to the regime when it shouldn't have been. There is also the regime versus the people binary, something that the civil war in Syria profoundly complicates. Is it sectarian or is it inclusive? Sectarianism is, a widely, is widely used particularly in the US media for explaining political situations in the Arab world in, again, a very uncomplicated way. The categories that make up these binaries, including other terms like kinship, class, and identity, are mobilized at the level of abstraction in an effort to maintain stable frames of reference. These are black boxes, and they serve as the unshakable basis for more uncertain theories, stemming from an arguably reasonable human proclivity to attempt to create reliable categories that will not fly away. But there is also a danger to using them and an intellectual laziness that is something so, that something so complex, for instance, Arab politics for the last three years, should be bracketed in terms that can be repurposed again and again in the name of power through labels of expertise. Consider the correlation between Said's discussion of the overlap between Gerard de Nerval's Orient, Journey to the Orient, and Edward Lane's Manners and Customs of the Modern Egyptians. They are, as Said has explained, essentially the same book written at different times. Compare this today to the celebratory reinforcement of the reductionist arguments in Fu F Fuad Ajami's book on the Syrian rebellion and, the, and, New York, and its uh, reinforcement by the review of this book by New York Times reviewer Dexter Filkins, who has eloquently and passionately 
uh, deconstructed in a recent article by Bassem Haddad on what he calls a job industry, or an assembly line of analyses packaged perfectly for media quoting, sound bites, and distribution that produces convenient, simple, digestible analyses that fit comfortably into pre-existing meta-narratives about the region that are comforting and useful for us. Haddad's list of meta-narratives aren't found only in the recesses of Fox News, but some at times can be found in even the more sympathetic and informed accounts. One pretense that he points out is the idea that any attempt to intervene in the Middle East by the U.S. government is done so on behalf of democracy. I don't think that this is necessarily something that uh, I, don't, I, I would hope that you all don't necessarily agree with this, but I think this is something that could be easily complicated. Uh, another is about the tragic tale of the wasted potential of the Arabs. They had freedom in their grasp, but why did they let it go? They could have done so much better for themselves that they have simply let go of their self-inflected cultural and traditional ailments. The ailment is usually traced back to Islam in one form or another. We might consider this in the context of reporting on the, in the, on the first post-Mubarak presidential election that brought the Muslim brother, Brotherhood to power. There is also the persistent narrative casting doubt over the national credentials of Arab states, as if there were some essence to a real or legitimate nation waiting to make an appearance once these people realize that peace is better than conflict, or that order is better than chaos. The emphasis of some kind of na nationhood deficiency in the Arab world obfuscates the much more concrete problems at hand, which Western governments have had no small part in contributing to. It also eclipses the fact that all nations are constructs and that the U.S. and countries in Europe have also dealt with their fair share of crises over national identity. Then there are the narratives about the primitive yearning for power among Arab dictators. The complex political and economic dimensions of how power is consolidated and negotiated are not easily packaged and ex in explanations of patrimonialism, which fill in for discussions of more nuanced state corporate alliances and the increasing and destabilizing structure of international capital. It is interesting here to note how often Arab regimes are seen as incompetent, but they are also able to co consolidate power with profound aptitude. Finally, the narrative of sectarianism, which is one of the most widely used explanations by the U.S. media to account for conflict in the region. The problem isn't that regimes or groups don't have sectarian dimensions or elements. The problem is when sectarian explanations become totalizing of all other explanations that might say more about the complexities of politics in heterogeneous societies. Haddad says about the Syrian regime, it does not produce all the way policies in the same way that, for instance, white supremacists in, the, in South Africa produce white policies because the politics of recruitment at the top level of power, or sorry, beyond the politics of recruitment at the top levels of power, the regime in Syria is an all way in terms of its public policies all of the time. The series of frames that I've outlined reveals the violence of representation in what David Campbell and Michael Shapiro have called state-oriented geographic imaginaries and relatedly in Basim Haddad's Ajam industry. So what can we do? I am unconvinced about the possibility of mediating something called the Arab uprisings, but I think we can continue to cultivate an awareness of these frames. I also think we can rethink mediation in this context as an attempt to reconcile a kaleidoscope of fractured and even mutually exclusive narratives, each of which requires that we also mediate the distance between ourselves and the impossibility of knowing what took place. This brings to mind one of Michel Foucault's phrases, knowledge is not made for understanding, it is made for cutting. This is a commentary on the impulse to think that certain forces indiscriminately present themselves in the present as they did in the past, think age-old sectarian conflicts as an explanation for conflict, for example. Foucault says that the for traditional devices for constructing a comprehensive view of history and for retracting the past as a patient and continuous development must be systemat systematically dismantled. This sentiment is taken up by Said in his various writings on hegemony as ordering the jumble of narratives in a way that brings linearity and coherence to U.S. domination. While we may not have the hindsight to speak about what these events did or the capacity to consider and relay these events in their full complexity, we can consider our understanding of how these revolutions were captured, relayed, and remembered by the media for public consumption in the form of meta narratives, narratives and binaries. And then we can then move from disorientation to disruption. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Department of Ethnic Studies, of course, for uh, organizing this. And especially uh, Brian, uh, where's Brian? Yeah, hey, yeah. 
he worked uh, hard on the uh, symposium for this uh, spring. Um, I succumbed and did the uh, primitive uh, PowerPoint. Uh, usually, I don't like PowerPoints, but I figured out that uh, we would do this uh, this time. And uh, <clears throat> the title uh, is the title of the uh, talk itself, which is Upheaval in the Middle East. So, Imperialism, Terrorism, and Revolution. And um, I, I want to thank Nicole for this wonderful uh, uh, narrative about uh, the uh, Arab world, let's say, um, or the Middle East, if you like. And uh, that, uh, what I would uh, uh, do now is um, just to go quickly over uh, what is it that uh, really has been happening and in what context should we put it, you know. Uh, and I think the context is very important uh, because <clears throat> as I will be talking about uh, the question of representation, for instance, is very critical. And there are ways of representing things like the Fuad Ajamis and uh, <clears throat> Zbigniew Brzezinski or um, Anderson Cooper or anyone else have their own uh, narratives. Uh, but uh, these are not the narratives of the population, uh, the indigenous population in the Middle East. I happen to be Palestinian, so I've been through a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of uh, experiences, uh, both, uh, <clears throat> well, in the diaspora, of course, whether the diaspora is uh, in Lebanon or Iraq or wherever for me, or also in the uh, United States or North America in general. So I would like to go quickly over um, the material, and then we can open for discussion. OK, this is. Uh, part of the Middle East, uh, and uh, just to show you what we're talking about in terms of the Middle East, so there's North Africa, Egypt, then uh, there's Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania, and uh, that way Yemen, uh, the Yemen is right there, and uh, Oman, the Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. Uh, so that's the Middle East. Turkey, Turkey and Iran, of course, are part of the Middle East, but uh, they are not Arab. And of course, we have the state of Israel in Palestine. Uh, that is uh, not Arab, although 20% of the uh, Israeli citizens, quote unquote, are uh, Arab Palestinians. Okay, so just to give you an idea about that, uh, keep it in mind so as we are referring to this. U.S. global geopolitical strategy. This is the context in which I, I would like to put what's really going on in the world uh, at this point. And uh, the Middle East, uh, well, uh, to protect its interest. I mean, this is like, you know, everybody knows that unless people believe in freedom, liberty, and democracy that the U.S. is for that kind of stuff, then it wouldn't be to protect its interests worldwide unless we say its interest is democracy and freedom and liberty. Uh, the Middle East is critical in this imperial design. And uh, there have been a number of books uh, uh, written uh, uh, about that. Um, but uh, the uh, thing is that uh, the United States has a strategy to encircle China and go uh, and also uh, the Russian Federation, uh, go to the soft belly of uh, Russia from like Iran and uh, through the Central Asian countries, uh, the states that were part of the uh, previous uh, Soviet Union. Okay, so and then control of Middle East oil and gas. Uh, regardless of what people might say, okay, well, the United States is going to have uh, be self-sufficient in oil and gas. Uh, in I don't know when, in five, 10 years, 15 years, what have you. The fact, uh, therefore, they don't need the Middle East and they want to shift their uh, uh, gaze to uh, the Pacific, like where we are now and even beyond, to, to deal with China and Russia from that, from that uh, side. But the fact of the matter, if anybody knows uh, anything about uh, <clears throat> uh, natural resources, uh, we find that actually you don't have to use oil and gas to be uh, interested in oil and gas, you use it and control it to deny it to other people. China, for instance, is looking all over the world for oil and gas. And uh, so if I deny it, that uh, energy source or those energy sources, um, it's good for U.S. policy. 
Plus the fact that uh, even like we say, oh, our friends are uh, the European Union uh, states and so forth, the fact of the matter is that the United States can influence European Union politics and individual countries in that union uh, through uh, oil and gas and other kinds of resources uh, access to. Uh, so this is the global uh, strategy and the Middle East is a critical uh, one in this and uh, we will go through why that is uh, the case. <clears throat> well, we know, historically speaking, from like, uh, I don't know when, from 1950s, if not before, that the <clears throat> US supports pro-US dictators, not all dictators, but pro-US dictators. For, um, as an example, like they, the United States uh, has uh, helped install uh, Saddam Hussein in power, and he was a major dictator, right? But then he was pro-US in a sense, or they, were able to use him, the U.S. was able to use him for a while, and then after they <coughs> chewed him uh, and uh, no more juice, uh, they spat him out, uh, and we know that. So that's an example of uh, supporting pro-U.S. dictators. Ensures Israel's military superiority, and the notion, uh, you know, the creation of Israel in Palestine and so forth, uh, speaks to that, unless uh, people think that, you know, this is like God gave them the country that was uh, where I was, uh, you know, where I was born, etc. And then I shouldn't be there. They should be there instead. And uh, then that would be another story. We can talk about that over coffee, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, to overthrow enemy regimes. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tell you much about this except uh, like pick and choose any place, you know. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> they tried it against Chavez in Venezuela. And now they're trying it against Maduro in Venezuela as well. I'm not sure if this time they're going to succeed. But the fact of the matter is that this has to do in, uh, in um, you know, um, there's a layer uh, of uh, interest, etc. has to do with the question of uh, what the Russian Federation is doing in Venezuela. You know, maybe they are uh, trying to find a port for their ships. And in fact, that is the case. Okay, and that's why one of the reasons you find things happening in Venezuela, as you see uh, them happening now in the Ukraine. I mean, the Ukraine is complicated. I don't want to say like X and Y and uh, black and white, etc. But part of the um, events that happening in the Ukraine is uh, because of this uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, like pressure and encircle the Russian Federation uh, by the United States. That's one reason. Uh, there are a number of other reasons. But we should not like forget about that and talk about, oh, well, Kerry said, you know, uh, we are for international law and uh, the Russians are intervening in uh, the Crimea or Crimea, whatever you call it. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the Russian Federation is wrong and we have to be with uh, freedom and democracy all over the place. <clears throat> So that's another narrative. This is the narrative from the State Department. This is the uh, narrative uh, from uh, the White House, etc. But that narrative is uh, suspect, uh, to say the least. And no one in the Middle East believes it. Uh, well, there are people who believe it, but by and large, no one believes it, uh, <clears throat> despite all the public diplomacy that the United States has created over the past many years. Um, we can talk more about that, if you like. <clears throat> so, strategy after September 11th, continue to support pro-U.S. dictators and undemocratic regimes, continue to ensure Israel's military superiority, overthrow regimes through military invasions where possible. Well, Afghanistan is one, you know, the Taliban, although I don't like the Taliban myself, but I mean the fact of the matter is that that's what happened. And we didn't go there to get Osama bin Laden, of course. <clears throat> Uh, but we went there uh, for oil and gas and other natural resources and also to be close to Iran and Russia and, uh, and, and China at the same time. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> blowback. I mean, this is uh, Chalmer, uh, Chalmer, uh, Chalmer Johnson's uh, title for a book. Um, <clears throat> I um, uh, borrowed it from him. <clears throat> U.S. defeat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. So one can say uh, that the U.S. Uh, was defeated in Iraq, but if you hear uh, the State Department, no, we were not defeated, right? And so <clears throat> you're going to like uh, 
uh, assess this uh, in terms of what were the goals of the U.S. when it went into Iraq and what happened after. Now, the question is, is the uh, Al-Qaeda and its sisters, as I call it in uh, another uh, slide, uh, is Al-Qaeda and its sisters weaker or stronger, you know, right now? And who made them weaker and who made them stronger? Okay, these are questions that uh, need to be addressed. Uh, <clears throat> as far as I, uh, the way I look at it is that uh, the Al-Qaeda and its sisters are very much stronger than they used to be before um, uh, in 911, let's say, you know. Okay, so the U.S. defeat in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, a lot of people talking about uh, what we say in Lebanon, the July War of 2006, but we don't say 2006, we just say the July War. The U.S., um, you know, it's an Israeli uh, action, but actually it is a U.S.-Israeli invasion of Lebanon. If you don't believe me, then you can uh, talk to Condoleezza Rice, and uh, she would tell you uh, what I'm saying. <coughs> um, the Arab upheaval, uh, 2010 and after. Okay, the, uh, the thing uh, is that <coughs> Now, U.S. attempts to contain the uprisings, right, that happened, uh, you know, from Bul, uh, Bouazizi in um, Tunisia on. Uh, they tried to contain the uprising. They quickly contained it in Tunisia. I mean, there was no, no big deal for that. Uh, but the interesting thing, how they contained uh, them, we will be talking uh, about it in a bit. Um, the Muslim Brothers and the United States, okay. I mean, I, uh, uh, I'm a frequent visitor to the Middle East. I mean, I lived there, I grew up there, and I visit um, you know, a couple of times a year and so forth. And uh, one uh, Egyptian uh, politician, uh, general secretary of one political party, an opposi opposition party, uh, he told me, Ibrahim, uh, I was sitting in his office, he said, <coughs> I don't want to say the name of the American guy, he said, he sat right there across from you and he offered me, I don't know how many million dollars, so that uh, he would support the notion of that uh, the Muslim brothers should uh, be in control of Egyptian politics. And so my friend, uh, he told him to go fly a kite, for instance, because uh, <clears throat> my friend has been all this uh, time like talking against uh, the Muslim Brothers and how dictatorial and neo-fascist were, they were, etc., and their history and so forth. Anyway, so the Americans, even when Mubarak was still in Egypt, uh, they were talking about how the Turkish model, you know, and by the way, the Turkish government is the Muslim Brother government, if you, uh, just FYI. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how the Turkish government could be the model um, because, uh, you know, uh, this is an Islamic world and therefore if we have the moderate Muslims, which are the Muslim brothers, then, you know, everything will be hunky-dory, we'll have good uh, relations with them and U.S. Uh, freedom and democracy and all that kind of stuff would prosper, have nothing to do with uh, oil and gas and other natural resources and geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, uh, location like, for instance, the Suez Canal, you know, you, you don't mention this when you talk about freedom and democracy. Um, so, the, uh, so the Turkish model becomes one size fits all and, uh, of course, <coughs> the Americans uh, <coughs> with the, their um, hubris and arrogance, uh, they keep doing the same thing, uh, hoping that uh, a new result would, uh, a different kind of result uh, would occur. And nothing of the sort has happened. If you do the same thing, the same result would happen. You know, I mean, that's uh, uh, what any uh, rational person would, uh, would do. So uh, the, uh, the Turkish model, in fact, uh, uh, when uh, like the, uh, <coughs> the uh, Egyptians uh, uh, got rid of Mubarak, uh, the uh, Egyptians actually, uh, the U.S. contained uh, that motion through the military, uh, Supreme Council uh, <coughs> of the Armed Forces. Uh, they had good relations with them, of course, with the military in Egypt. And also the military and the Muslim brothers with the 
help of, uh, uh, of the United States uh, started playing footsies, you know, and uh, they basically, the Muslim Brothers were able to capture, um, you know, uh, the government uh, there. Uh, so everything was hunky-dory, or so it seemed for a while. Okay, um, the implications in terms of the Arab upheaval, etc., implications of the war in Syria, another place where the Americans were really uh, wanted to destabilize was uh, Syria. Regardless of one, I'm not here talking about whether you love Syria or you don't love Syria, or whatever. This is, uh, this is another level of analysis we can go to. I mean, I, I've written a few things on that. But uh, the point is that <clears throat> what does it say? How do you destabilize Syria? How, did, uh, how uh, was Syria destabilized? Well, by using our enemies Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is fighting in Syria. There are at least 50,000, if not more, uh, mil uh, you know, uh, Islamist, uh, terrorist, takfiris, we call them takfiris, um, jihadi groups, uh, in, you know, uh, people in Syria fighting the government. Regardless of what you might think of the government, that's what's happening in, in Syria. U.S. support of terrorism in Syria, and that really spills over to Lebanon and so forth. Uh, the, uh, Nicole was talking about the uh, <clears throat> explosions and uh, of you know car bombings and all that kind of stuff, uh, suicide bombings uh, through cars and you know uh, all that. Uh, you know it's the spillover of that war in Syria, supported by the United States, by the way, uh, um, in, into Lebanon. Okay, so this is uh, an important uh, thing to look. If you are really fighting terrorism, you know, why would you support uh, terrorists in Syria? Okay, I mean, this is like mind-boggling. Uh, but because they would use terrorists in Syria, as they used them in, uh, in Afghanistan, if you remember, in the late 80s, uh, uh, in the late 70s, 78, 79, uh, and in the 80s uh, <clears throat> against the Soviet Union at the time in Afghanistan because uh, Reagan well, we used to talk to them. I, I heard them, I watched them on TV a number of times saying, well, these are like the equivalent of our founding fathers, right, yeah. So there you go. <clears throat> uh, so the other thing that also Nicole talks about is the promotion of sectarian differences in Lebanon, in Syria, etc. Uh, Syria, uh, is not uh, an Islamist regime, etc. It's um, uh, it's just completely diametrically opposed to that, right? And uh, it's a secular regime, and uh, they don't. You know, you in Syria, many times you will be talking to someone, you don't know if he's a Muslim or Christian or whatever uh, they are. So they're talking about like uh, the Alawites, the Sunnis, the Shias, the Christians, you know, and all that. That is really. Uh, an intentional kind of discourse that the U.S. uses. So even like uh, Kerry said um, recently, like past couple of months or something, says, well, if Assad goes, we will guarantee, I mean, the United States will guarantee the security of the Alawites. You know, it's a sect, you know, Shia, of, uh, a sect of the Shia. Uh, we guarantee the security of the Alawites as though uh, the question, uh, in Syria was, is about the Christians and Muslims and Shia and Sunni and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is uh, like the narrative that they want us to believe in and therefore we are going there to help the poor uh, refugees of Syria or Lebanon or whatever as they help the poor refugees of Palestine, right? I mean, there are refugees in Palestine since 1948, you know, Palestinian refugees since 1948. What did the U.S. do for them? They're helping the Israelis keep taking over more land and building more uh, colonies. Uh, people call them settlements. I call them a spade a spade as a colony uh, through the, the theft of land, etc. And so promoting sectarian differences and dividing the Arab world. And that is exactly what's happening. And it's not only dividing the Arab world, but disintegrating uh, states like uh, Iraq, for instance, for all practical purposes, is uh, like divided already. Uh, you go and see the mess in Libya. Libya is divided. So long I, the United States, France, and England take, uh, you know, share the oil, you know, share the spoils of war, which is the oil. Um, we don't care, you know, what happens to uh, Libya. 
And in Libya, of course, I mean, uh, terrorists are all over the place. Okay? They are in the armed forces, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> they have the security of Tripoli, which is the capital of Libya. Um, <clears throat> uh, the terrorists, you know, Qaeda, like people, have that. Okay, the Middle East and big power uh, politics. And this is, uh, Syria is a battlefield for the, games, the, for the game of nations. I mean, the whole thing regarding uh, the Russian Federation and, uh, and the Americans, I mean, they are duking it out right there, you know, in Syria, okay? Now, this is one layer of analysis. It doesn't mean that there aren't other things happening as well. But the fact of the matter, this trumps it all, okay? So would, for instance, the Russian Federation allow Syria to fall down and then no more like Russian fleet in Tartus, you know, in the Mediterranean? Impossible, you know? Would uh, the Russian Federation uh, get rid of Crimea just to please uh, Mr. Kerry and uh, what's his name, uh, Obama? No, it's not going to happen, okay? So I can tell you that, although I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, you, you can take that uh, for granted. Uh, so Syria is a battlefield for the game of nations. And when we talk about the game of nations, later on I'm talking about like regional powers as well, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, etc. But that's a bit later. Uh, Egypt, U.S. returns through the Muslim Brothers, and we talked a little bit about that. And this is a very critical point. In fact, if it is the Muslim world and they are all idiots, you know, how come then there were 30 million people on the streets, you know, in Egypt on <coughs> June 30th protesting Muslims, protesting the Muslim Brothers and say, no, we don't want the Muslim Brothers to rule us. If all Muslims think alike, you know, then uh, Orientalist uh, notions, and thanks to Fuad Ajami, he's, uh, by the way, he's a Shia Muslim from Lebanon. And the, <clears throat> don't uh, quote me on this, but uh, uh, some friends of mine in Lebanon said, like, even his family disowned him because, uh, you know, he was an embarrassment to them, you know, in terms of how he, like, went into the <clears throat> laps uh, of the Israelis, the Zionists, and APAC, you know, in the United States, and was fundraising uh, uh, for the for the Israelis, etc. That's at one point. <clears throat> but anyway, so um, uh, Syria, a battlefield uh, for the game of nations. Egypt, the U.S. returns uh, through the Muslim Brothers uh, into. Uh, but then, you know, I always say, you know, at conferences or when I write, etc. I always bet on Al Midan. You know, we know Al Midan, right? Tahrir Square. So now in uh, Ukraine, they talk about Medan, right? <laughs> because uh, it becomes like uh, something like in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, the revolutionary process and uh, social movements, political movements. Uh, this is uh, a new uh, term that is being used in those kinds of revolutionary movements, um, whether revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, what have you. But the fact of the matter is that from the Medan, you know, the, Amer uh, the, uh, the Egyptians really uh, got rid of the Muslim brothers who were uh, pro-U.S., okay? Uh, so it's not the Muslims uh, all think alike, uh, etc. The U.S. is basically hated in Egypt. I mean, there are maybe a couple of million who love them, but uh, that's neither here nor there. They cannot, uh, like, mobilize 30 million people, those people who love the U.S., in Egypt to go down. So that's uh, an important thing that the U.S. has been defeated uh, in Egypt in terms of the Muslim Brothers, but yet they have other, uh, you know, designs, uh, maybe through the military, etc. So the revolutionary process is continuing, yeah, uh, and it's, it's not going to stop until one or the other wins, uh, you know, uh, the, the battle, I mean the big battle. Okay, Lebanon extending the war in Syria through terrorist acts. We have talked about that. Uh, about that. Iraq, terrorist acts continue after U.S. withdrawal. Okay, U.S. withdraws in 2011. And just before they started uh, withdrawing, uh, more suicide bombing, etc. Now, every month, <clears throat> it's like 1,000 dead. 
I mean, forget about the wounded. 1,000 dead in Iraq, thanks to the U.S. and the weapons of mass destruction that they went to get rid of and all of that. Okay? Uh, Jordan is a, in a precarious situation. On the one hand, Jordan knows that <coughs> the U.S., in fact, uh, let me say it uh, openly, the U.S. has threatened the Jordanian regime, who is pro-U.S., that if you don't do this, we can mobilize the Muslim brothers in demonstrations and protests in Amman, the capital, and everywhere else. And in fact, that's what was happening. Once the Jordanian monarchy, it's a monarch, pro-U.S. guy, uh, said, okay, we do what you like, no more protest by the Muslim brothers. Okay. People who have uh, their ear to the ground can figure this out, regardless of all the bullshit public diplomacy that the U.S. can do in, the, in that area. Iran, a regional, a regional power facing the West. I mean, we can talk about the uh, nuclear file and, uh, you know, uh, other, other things regarding uh, Iran-Israeli relations or lack thereof. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the U.S. Well, has been gunning for Iran for the longest time because, of course, <clears throat> uh, the U.S. doesn't want, like, nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. Although, like, even Mubarak himself said we shouldn't have any nuclear, you know, nuclear-free Middle East. But, of course, the U.S. said no because Israel has 200 nuclear warheads. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Pro-imperialist regional state players, Saudi Arabia domi uh, dominant in the region, and it and Qatar, they give a lot of money for terrorists in the, in the region. Now they are fighting among each, uh, between each other, the, uh, the uh, Qataris and the Saudis, but this, uh, this is like a sideshow. The fact of the matter, they are still mobilizing terrorists and they are still funding terrorists to fight in uh, Syria, in Iraq, and also spilling over to Lebanon, thanks to the Saudis. Okay, uh, Qatar, we talked about that. Turkey is a very interesting one. Turkey, because it has borders on Syria, uh, you know, uh, yeah, borders with Syria, uh, Turkey has been influential in, uh, in fact, now, now, in Turkey now, there are three major military camps for Al-Qaeda, in Turkey, right now, as we speak, okay? So Turkey is part of NATO, close to the U.S., although there are some problems now with the U.S., but that's another matter. We can talk about Turkey later on, maybe in another uh, symposium or, with, uh, or some kind of other talk, because Turkey is a very important player right there. So Turkey, from a policy of zero problems, yeah, you know, uh, <clears throat> The uh, Turkish foreign policy is that, you know, we should have zero problems with our neighbors. Well, we now know that uh, <clears throat> uh, Turkey has zero friends in terms of neighbors, right, thanks to the Turkish government. Uh, in fact, to the point that last June there were protests in Istanbul and uh, other places across uh, Turkey because of the Muslim Brother government's policies regarding uh, its neighbors, especially its interference uh, with the, uh, in the Syrian uh, conflict. Okay? Uh, Pro-imperialist non-state players, Al-Qaeda and its sisters and the Muslim brothers. <clears throat> Where did the Al-Qaeda come from? I mean, you know, in terms of uh, ideology, etc. Thanks, thanks to the Muslim brothers. The Muslim brothers have been in uh, <clears throat> Uh, in existence for, uh, well, since 1928, I don't know. Uh, you figure that out how long that is. But, uh, and of all the, um, you know, jihadi, takfiri uh, people, um, you know, Islamists, uh, they came out from the Muslim Brothers, okay? Uh, the, 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 the narrative is complicated, but uh, for now we can say that uh, without really uh, running into problems, we can, uh, expand on that later on. Uh, other non-state players, Hezbollah in Lebanon, that in fact defeated the American-Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 2006. Okay? Uh, to the point that the Israelis were telling the Americans, we got to stop the war, and the Americans tell, no, you go for another week. You know? Ask Condoleezza Rice if you don't agree with me. Uh, Hamas is an interesting thing. Hamas, on the one hand, is a, 
and uh, well, uh, it's a Muslim Brother organization, okay? and it comes out from the Muslim Brothers of Egypt. However, Hamas is in a, has a problem. Uh, that is to say, it's sitting in Gaza and control, uh, controlling Gaza internally, but it is uh, <clears throat> uh, basically surrounded by the Israeli enemy, and the Israeli enemy has control over air, land, and uh, sea. Uh, so it's uh, under siege. Uh, Gaza is under siege. And when Mubarak was there, he would uh, make Gaza under siege from the land, uh, from the um, Egyptian side. Uh, there are others. Uh, I don't want to mention m m much of that. But a lot of them actually is... Uh, uh, um, is like in Lebanon and in other places, uh, non-state players. But non-state players are not only like the Hezbollah or Hamas. There are uh, political players. Like we have uh, in Lebanon, for instance, the uh, 14th March Alliance, which is actually pro-Saudi. And the head of the alliance is uh, a Lebanese guy, you know, Al-Hariri, the son of the uh, previous Prime Minister Rafi Al Hariri, who was like you know uh, <clears throat> bombed out of existence uh, through a you know anyway he was passing his car was passing uh, in, near the um, uh, hotel areas uh, hotels area in Lebanon and just the car exploded we don't know who killed them now uh, but uh, <clears throat> the the this guy uh, Saad Al Hariri his son. Uh, he's Lebanese, but he has also Saudi citizenship. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, mostly uh, uh, resides in Saudi Arabia, unless he's in Europe or something like that. Okay? U.S. policy and the Jewish state. I'm going to go back like, you know, a full circle. In a sense, um, uh, U.S. policy, uh, the Jewish state is a very important notion. Destroying the resistance movement in the Middle East. The U.S. wants to destroy the resistance movement in, in, the, in the Middle East. That's why they, uh, you know, uh, wiping out the resistance in Palestine, trying to wipe it out in Lebanon in 2006. They didn't uh, succeed. They're still trying through all kinds of machinations, political, diplomatic, and military. Um, there are in Lebanon now at least 10,000 Qaeda and Qaeda and, um, you know, other Takfiri organization, 10,000 people at least in Lebanon, you know, waiting sleep, uh, sleeper cells and, uh, and not, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, cells that are awake as opposed to sleeper cells, you know, uh, and they're doing uh, operations. Um, <clears throat> so in that, uh, the Israeli and the Kerry uh, thing is now, uh, his like uh, shuttle diplomacy basically, it reminds you of Kissinger. Kissingers, um, eliminating national Palestinian rights. What is happening now in terms of Palestine-Israeli uh, negotiations is to try and get rid of Palestinian rights and have a Jewish state as opposed to Israeli state for all of its citizens, including the 20% Arabs who are Christian Muslims living in the state of Israel and Palestine. And then creating an internationally recognized Israeli apartheid state, because if you say Jewish state, then no one else can live there. And maybe it will be like ethnic cleansing of the 20% uh, of uh, Arab citizens in the, in the state of Israel and Palestine. OK. Uh, achieving a strategic goal, going back to uh, the question of encircling uh, China and uh, the, Russian, the, the Russian Federation. Here is the Black Sea and the Crimea and all that. So it takes us full circle, regardless of the fact that there are many layers uh, in so far as like Ukraine is concerned or Syria, etc. But I think this is in terms of the larger picture in terms of the U.S. geopolitical strategy for the area. Venezuela, the Middle East and the Ukraine, conflict zones to advance U.S. interests. The greater Middle East is central in this global strategy. Mahalo Noeloa. Yes. Ibrahim. Yeah. I have a question.
question about um, the Turkish government and the Muslim Brothers. That's somehow new to me. Are you saying some members in the government? Are you saying the AK party? AK, uh, AKP, AKP is Muslim Brothers, period. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And when did that start? Uh, the AKP? Well, well, not the AKP, but, but, uh, but you know, when did that infiltration of Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey start? Well, the AKP, 2001, mm -hmm. uh, 2002, they took over. Right. And then they started, like, uh, infiltrating the state. I know, like, uh, from, uh, I spent, like, about, uh, well, I was on sabbatical last semester. I spent uh, about two and a half uh, months in the Middle East, mostly in uh, Turkey, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I know from uh, universities, I mean, a lot of my colleagues are complaining. I mean, they are Muslim, but at the same time, uh, they are secular, right? And they say, what is this? Like, for instance, if you and I apply for a job, you know, you are Muslim, uh, AKP, pro AKP, you get the job. Yeah, you find like someone who is assistant professor, and they put him like, uh, you know, promote him quickly and then put him in, uh, uh, a dean, you know, <laughs> become a dean or something. <laughs> These guys, you know, been working their asses off, for instance, over a long period of time, and they cannot be a dean or anything of the sort, you know. So, the AKP. And then, in fact, uh, <clears throat> the Fatula Gulan uh, organization is very important. And they were, uh, in fact, uh, uh, allies of the AKP in this. But the Fatullah Gulen is an interesting one. I mean, a lot of my uh, friends <coughs> who are secular uh, think they have relations with the uh, CIA, you know. And uh, this guy, uh, Fatullah, Fatullah Gulen, he's been for the longest time uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, living in Pennsylvania. So all of a sudden, because uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who is the prime minister, uh, started like having uh, <clears throat> like openings to Iran, then all of a sudden uh, there's like a rift between him and Golan, and uh, they are duking it out, which is good for me because the Islamists would uh, like be wiping out each other, um, you know. So it'll be good for the secularists in that case. Uh, but at the same time, is that uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is uh, winning this thing, right? And he's opening even uh, like uh, to uh, Iran in a very important way. Because, you know, although he's NATO, he's in NATO, or Turkey is in NATO, the fact of the matter is that uh, <clears throat> he uh, wants uh, Iran for a very important problem for Turkey, which is the, uh, the Kurdish uh, question. Okay? So already all these things um, complicate the story, uh, so much so that we cannot say, well, you know, uh, Turkey is in NATO, therefore it has no, like, differences with the United States. No, there are. It has differences. Even Saudi Arabia has differences, etc. But anyway, I'll give you that one. Yes? So you said there, there are three Al-Qaeda um, camps yes. in Turkey. Yeah. First of all, is, does the Turkish government recognize do they, they know about them. I mean, they train them and send them into the, through the border. Uh -huh. And, and yeah. what sort of implications does that have with... Well, this is, uh, this is the problem. One reason it seems to me that uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is also tilting a little bit and moving away from intervention, direct uh, intervention, and a lot of it, that he's still intervening in, in Syria, but uh, it's decreasing. Uh, one reason, because now <coughs> they felt the heat from Al-Qaeda, etc., because Al-Qaeda knows no borders and knows no friends. Like, you know, later on, I'm going to hit you in Turkey, in Istanbul, etc. Can you imagine, like, if three bombs, car bombs happened in Istanbul, what would happen to the tourism uh, industry? Yeah? I mean, it's really... Um, so, uh, and the Americans, it's interesting, they use the Al-Qaeda and uh, its sisters, uh, but so long they are doing uh, problems, making problems there, you know, so long they don't come to us here. But now Europe is closer to Syria than it is to the uh, uh, than Syria is to the United States, right? Uh, so, um, but the fact of the matter, the Europeans are feeling the heat, you know, and even the Brits uh, have uh, captured a few guys who had come back from Syria because then they were afraid they would do something 
uh, in London, you know, and then London happened in 2007 and uh, 2005 and stuff like that, 2005. Yeah, so they are afraid. In Spain, it happened, etc. And even, uh, you know, the Boston bomber, I mean, he didn't have to be, like, trained by Osama bin Laden, you know, because uh, Osama is no longer with us, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the fact of the matter, this is an ideology, and that ideology uh, can... Uh, uh, move anyone, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. yes. I actually have a question for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about the, uh, I worked in the news media for a while, and I find Twitter a refreshing alternative because it's not mediated. There is a problem with knowing who's behind them, but like recently there was a um, hashtag called Not Your Narrative that was being used by Arabic women, not only against Westerners' depictions of them, but Arabic men as well. And they were reclaiming some of their stories about whether or not to veil. And I, I was curious to see you just throw it in with all the other media as though it were the same. Um, so uh, I, I would agree with you that Twitter, as opposed to something like Instagram or Facebook, if we're talking about social media platforms, is probably um, uh, more committed to uh, sort of, you know, like openness on the internet, right? Um, and one of the things I guess I could kind of refer to is that um, the U.S. government often requests a lot of these companies turn over information on their users. And Twitter had actually not done that. And one of the other things that it had done is um, in 2009, uh, during the Green Movement in Iran, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, they were scheduled to do maintenance, and the United States government had said, I don't know if you knew this, had asked if, yeah, and they didn't. Um, so yeah, I guess um, I, I think I would say they're not exactly the same, but they all they are a proprietary network. And so when we think about social networks as platforms for uh, you know public discourse, these kind of open like virtual publics, right? We also need to take it, that into account, that aspect of their existence into account. Um, also, uh, um, my point was not necessarily that. Uh, uh, and when I was talking about Twitter, the point wasn't necessarily that it was free or less free, but that it was limited in the amount of information that you can actually post uh, in a particular, uh, you know, in a tweet, right? It's 150 characters. So I'm just asking, how much can you actually get across? What kind of sentiments can you get across? And is that almost just like the, the kind of algorithmic language, right, the way that the program actually works and the way it's sort of shaping the way that we communicate with each other, what does that say about the way it produces these kinds of snapshots of reality, right? That we're satisfied with these just, you know, this kind of instant information that's kind of in and out, right? And then we're on to the next thing. As opposed yeah, to... I disagree <coughs> with that. It, there is only 140 characters, but nobody does one. It's a stream. It's yeah. a stream of consciousness. And so if I'm following one person, I'm in a conversation with them that can range over days. Sure. I'm not just getting one synthesized nubbin at the end that's their view of the situation. I can watch it unfold. Yeah, and, and yeah. A, a lot of the times people will have like you know 144 characters, but they'll span like you know, 20 to to make like a write a long essay essentially on Twitter, through 20 separate posts. So I would essentially just, can't count as one. Yeah. Post. So I guess I, I mean I can definitely I definitely see your point, but I would just also say that uh, not everybody communicates that way, right? Not everybody is on Twitter 24/7 communicating, you know, every five minutes about an update about a particular story or their life or whatever it is that they're doing. So for people who are communicating in that way, yes, maybe they have a fuller experience, right? But not everyone is getting that experience. I do think that it is shaping the way that we communicate in ways we haven't really fully considered yet. Certainly, the the, the 144 character limit uh, compels people to write 144 characters or less, you know, right. most people are going to be within that limit, but there is the possibility to write longer. Sure. Which is what I think is about. I think we have time for one more question. I still like to dig a little bit in <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> because, you know, Turks and Arabs, uh, you know, are not traditionally friends exactly. So, we love each other. Um, <laughs> right. So that, you know, kind of the history of that um, Muslim Brotherhood ideas in Turkey. So how do you see it? You see it as, um, as a scene controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. You see it as a way of exporting some ideas and adapting them to a new setting. Um, 
you see you see major different players within the Turkish Muslim. I mean, it's it's there is much more to it, obviously. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So uh, whatever you can say, well, yeah. I appreciate. Well, it. I mean, you know, the AKP itself is now divided into mm -hmm. more than one uh, yeah. wing. Yeah. So they have a bird with three wings, maybe I don't know. But the point is that they are divided, yeah. And a lot of it, I, uh, I mean, I, I dug in a little bit when I was there, uh, has to do with the uh, Syrian question, okay? Because uh, some, some people who went to the AKP, I mean, they're really pious uh, Muslims and they thought that they're doing the right thing, you know? And, uh, you know, our traditions and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the fact of the matter, when they saw what happened in uh, Syria, say, what the hell are we doing, you know? So there are those kinds of things. There are other reasons why other wings or um, uh, trends within the AKP. So I don't know what might happen to the AKP, but uh, the thing is that the Fatullah Gulen was also Muslim, you know, Islamist, that is. Um, they don't like what uh, the AKP is doing, or Recep Tayyip Erdogan. In fact, uh, <coughs> Abdullah Gul, who's the president, who's also AKP, he's leading another trend within uh, the AKP. So you can see, like, there's all kinds of disintegration or cracks, uh, let me put it this way. So <coughs> the story is not over, you know, until it's over, you know, as we say. But uh, <laughs> the, 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 the problem is that these are dangerous times, and the U.S. Uh, machinations is f to control, uh, you know, uh, there's a book called Full Spectrum Dominance, right? And full spectrum dominance uh, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the military strategy, U.S. military strat strategy to dominate the entire re uh, the entire globe. You know, so why? So that we can have better freedom and democracy? No, to have like, well, I, I don't want to tell you why. <laughs> yes, Raheem, you mentioned that uh, U.S. American foreign policy. <coughs> It's really designed to, to surround China and, and Russia. And I agree with that. But, uh, but I think um, you're not stressing enough the um, decline of American uh, capability to pursue that objective. America had a military base in Kyrgyzstan, like just yeah. on the border of China, western mm -hmm. border of China. Mm -hmm. This is being pulled yeah. back. Yes. Kyrgyzstan does, it's kicking us out. Yeah. Okay. America was fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, partly to, to in pursuit of that anti-Chinese yeah. and anti-Russian mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. We're losing in, in, uh, we lost in Iraq and Afghanistan, essentially. In Syria, we don't like what, uh, uh, Pentagon doesn't like what is happening. Obama at one point says, um, well, there's a red line being crossed, and it's not going to be crossed with impunity. So Secretary of State Kerry, he says, yeah, you know, we, we, we'll probably be bombing Syria, but it will be incredibly small, he says. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but, and then, yeah. then Obama yeah. says, no, we don't do pinpr pinprints. Yeah. In other words, we're, we're not right. bombing right. Syria. This is another uh, evidence of American decline right no no I, I agree with the decline I just like uh, I didn't deal with it uh, really except to say that uh, you know US was defeated uh, in certain areas like in Lebanon etc and if um, you know in terms of peaceful protests peaceful quote-unquote protests uh, in Egypt uh, or anywhere in the Arab world I would bet on the Medan on Tahrir Square or Tahrir becomes uh, uh, you know a metaphor I mean it doesn't have to be like the Medan and Tahrir Square but uh, you know uh, to, to defeat uh, those uh, U.S. policies of containment uh, or try to uh, rescue as much of its influence, say, in Egypt or Tunisia or wherever, you know. So that is true. However, um, when we say the U.S. is declining, a declining power, that's true. But declining in relationship to what? Um, first of all, the political economy in the United States is not doing well. One more... Uh, you know, uh, event like 2007, 2008 would wipe us out, really, 
seriously, I mean significantly, let me put it this way. Um, but also because China and Russia are rising. So uh, in relationship to that, there is a decline. But still, I mean, the U.S. has the largest market in the entire world, the largest market, uh, the largest polit uh, market. You know, political economy is still large, yeah, and the, the military is the best and the strongest. Yeah, the military is the uh, best and the strongest. With, but, no, no, the yeah, yeah. With the, with the in no, no, uh, no, I understand. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, uh, when they wanted to bomb Syria, you know where did they go? They went to the Iranians and asked them, I'm not kidding, the Americans went to the Iranians and asked them, well, it would be a limited thing. Uh, they told them, no, don't do that. Because <clears throat> not that the uh, Iran would defeat the United States, but uh, you know, in, a, in an open war, army to army, no. But the fact of the matter, they said, if you hit uh, Syria, that means the entire region would blow up, OK? Because they know if you hit Syria, then you defeat Syria, then you're coming after us. We're not going to play that game. We're going to all fight the war you know, together against US troops, etc. The U.S. Will, would have lost the war. Why? Based on what has happened to U.S. troops in Afghanistan and, uh, you know, in Iraq, and uh, what happened to Israeli troops in Lebanon, you know, in 2006. Yeah, so, no, I agree with you. Yeah. Mm. But, but, uh, well, but you, you, you're still uh, being impressed by American economic power. And military power. No, no, right? no. I'm not impressed. Uh, <laughs> because I said, like, one more uh, hit, like 2007, 2008, finito la musica for us. Yeah. For a long time, at least. Yeah. OK. So are we done? Uh, yeah, well, there's one more quick question. I know that there's somebody. Oh, I was going to ask Nicole a question. Is that OK? Yeah, sure. Go. Oh, sure. Um, a comment and question. Uh, first of all, I thought that the depiction of the uh, perforating narrative that you gave about the bird and the, the human bullet was incredibly compelling, and more of those would be really interesting to hear about, I mean, in a later date. Um, and then I thought it, it was incredibly beautifully written in the way that you talked about the disorientation. Um, but I was wondering what you meant by the disruption portion, um, where you ended, and what you foresaw that leading to or looking like. So, um, you know, part of that is... Um, this idea of disruption as a way of kind of oh <laughs> okay um, so you know I think I mean a lot of things right and we can think about this in, in terms of layers of disruption so one of the layers of disruption would be this presentation right on the series of binar binarisms and meta narratives that we often sort of hear you know in, in different stories right in different capacities uh, that we often take for granted, right? They're just kind of, they're just in the background constantly. And so trying to think about that when we're reading a news story, right? Or when we're reading about uh, who it is that's getting the attention, right? So we should always be politicizing what we're reading. Um, and so that's kind of part of that disruption. Uh, the other part of disruption is like thinking up new categories, right? So this is kind of what I'm trying to do in my dissertation. I'm talking about Saudi women gamers. I'm talking about uh, harassmap.com um, and other ways of kind of rethinking what, uh, you know, feminist agency means, not in a liberal context, but in a much different context that takes things like technology and, uh, and engagements with technology. Uh, and embodiment into consideration, right? So this is like a different way of thinking about Middle East politics from the very like interesting and useful and really important work that like Brahim is doing, for instance. And so it's I see it as sort of supplementary, right? But also sort of experimental uh, in that kind of disruptive sense. And so I think uh, maybe one, another way of putting it would be, um, you know, Foucault talks about effective histories, right? That history is is never constant, right? So we should always be rethinking how these things are changing, right? And and not kind of relying on the same types of tropes and prototypes, right, for describing this particular area of the world, which we, you know, do all the time, right? It'd be exhausting to think about it constantly, but we should try to kind of start to cultivate an awareness about this thing. So this was sort of my way of kind of preliminarily mapping it, I, I suppose. So. Well, thank you so much for the very thoughtful discussion, and join me in uh, thanking our two speakers.